Welcome to another episode of This Is Metal with Joe Lawson. Well, Joe, um, today we're going to do um, an episode on... I've been wanting to do um, an episode on Megadeth for a while, and they've been in the news lately, so I thought this was a real great um, reason um, to do an episode. So um, we're going to get on that, but we're going to talk about the whole history of the band. So um, as you know, Megadeth is an American... Uh, Heavy metal band formed by ex-Metallica guitarist Dave Mustaine after he was fired by Metallica, and um, for for many many years he had like a rivalry with uh, um, the guys in Metallica. As far as you know, when he, he formed Megadeth, his his main intent was that he wanted his band to be bigger and better. And I don't know if we can say he was uh, that Megadeth was ever bigger than Megadeth, but they were. Uh, I mean, as big as Metallica, but they they got to be just as big. I mean, so much that they are in. Uh, they're what is considered the big four bands, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. Definitely uh, one of the more successful, well-known... Thrash uh, bands. Thrash metal bands to ever emerge. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny because Dave Mustaine uh, was was fired, and, uh, you know, this was before Metallica even put out Kill 'Em All. So oh, yeah. Metallica was just the... Uh, an up and comer too. I mean, they were nobody essentially at that time. And um, this was in the early '80s, and neither one of these bands really had established themselves as a, as a major name yet. Yeah. In, in, in any uh, format, and I think it's interesting that you know Dave Mustaine just you know if he was such a if he had such a drinking problem, which I'm not saying he didn't. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, he was able to carry on. He he picked up, he put a new band together, and bam! I mean, it was just you know, it wasn't that bad. It, when you read the history on this and look it up, yeah. it's almost like it happened in a day. You know? Oh yeah, like, and you know, you know, he just yeah. went out. And he's like, okay, fuck you guys. I'm gonna put my own band together, and that's exactly what he did. In fact, you know, um, to get a little deeper into that before we really get talking about Megadeth, um, you make a couple good points there. I mean, um, now a lot of people may not even be aware of this, but if you go back to Kill 'Em All, the very first album. Dave Mustaine actually, um, although he does not play a lick on that album, he has some uh, songwriting credits on there. If you check the, um, if yeah, he wrote a lot of the riffs on that yeah. uh, on that record. And on the bus trip back to Los Angeles after he got kicked out of the band, yeah. he found a pamphlet on the floor about by California Senator Alan Cranston that read, "The Arsenal of Megadeth can't be rid no matter what the peace treaties come to." Wow. So the term Megadeth stuck with uh, Mustaine after seeing that, and he changed the name uh, to the current M E G A D E T H Megadeth, as we know it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and according to Dave Mustaine, that represented the annihilation of power. I thought that was kind of interesting. That's how he came up uh, with the name Megadeth. And how ironic is it that um, you know this, again? This is very early in Metallica's um, career, but he's like go from a band um, before they even had their debut album out, but. Um, how interesting yeah, 1983. That, how interesting that he's let go by Metallica because he's such a heavy alcoholic, and um, years later James Hetfield will go on to become just as bad of an alcoholic. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, funny how that circle happened. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, uh, before that, uh, Dave tried to put a band, put Megadeth together um, in the initial beginnings of it, and he formed a band called Fallen Angels, okay. and. Um, they later changed the name to Megadeth, but they had went through a, a number of drummers, and uh, him and David Ellison are the uh, two that kind of stuck it out uh, from that beginning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, formed that good tight musical bond in their early days, and then they went on to uh, finally finding a drummer, Lee Roush. Lee Roush was uh, able to uh, incorporate time signature changes and uh, play some of the stuff that they, that they were wanting to do, because obviously... Uh, the Megadeth music is not, you know, four four, you know, four beats per measure. It's not uh, pretty simple and straight up. It's a lot more technical and requires somebody that uh, can understand that and comprehend and, and pull that off. And uh, so it was a little difficult for him at first finding a drummer that could uh, that could do that back in 1983. Yeah, you know, and while um, you know, people need to remember too at this time um, back in 1983, that um, he's forming Megadeth. I mean. Um, you know, probably Metallica and then Megadeth was probably the closest thing they, to they had to thrash bands back then. I mean, it really was not even called, uh, it was just called metal back then. It was not even considered thrash until some of these other bands would kind of follow what they were doing, you know. And um, people people need to know that originally Mustaine had wanted um, 
to hire a singer for Megadeth, but after a long search for singers, he felt that no one else could really perform, you know, his songs that he was writing as he had kind of envisioned the songs and, you know, kind of heard them in his head. Now, as a singer, Joe, can you can you kind of, uh, I mean, could you imagine um, writing all the songs for your band and, you know, just, you know, being the guitar player if you were able to do that and having somebody else kind of um, sing your songs and maybe them coming out differently than the way you wrote them? Well, that's, that's just the thing. I mean, some people um, work, at, work in a different capacity, so to speak, and it's easier for them to, uh, to do... One thing, uh, yes. Compromise, you know, yeah. in their vision. And some people have, you know, a creative uh, vision and a goal, and they hear something in, you know, a, a style, a certain direction, and uh, a certain tone, and uh, things like that. And they get fixated on it sometimes. But uh, a lot of times those people are visionaries and they are successful. And Dave Mustaine is one of those people. Yeah, and I'll tell you. It's kind of funny, you know, yeah. people say, well, you know, Dave Mustaine's not that great of a singer. No, he's not. He's not a technical, amazing vocalist with a, a multi-octave range or none of that. But what Dave Mustaine is, is very unique. As soon as you hear that snarl, as soon as you hear him sing a phrase, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You know that that's Dave Mustaine. I mean, there's no mistake in it. And that's what he has, and that's what he was able to build Megadeth on. Oh, yeah. His, his creative vision and his uniqueness. And, of course, his talent. Anybody that can play guitar the way he does and sing something different entirely. And be I mean, the main, it's, difficult, yeah. it's difficult, number one, it's difficult for a musician to yeah. sing and play at the same time. It is, ask any of them. Yeah. But... But to be able to play something very technical, the way Dave Mustaine does, and then sing a vocal phrase that's different than what you're playing at the same time, not yeah. many people can do that. Yeah, I, I've talked to a lot of guys over the years who I've interviewed, and they've told me exactly that. And see, um, with being a guitar player, first of all, um, you, you got to remember, you know, play all the notes exactly as is. And, and, and at the same time, and uh, we're talking about a guy like Dave Mustaine, besides being just, um, you know, the guitar player, he's a front man. He's got a... He's got to talk to the audience. He's got to rap with them. He's got to, um, you know, introduce the songs. He, he's got to look at the audience. He's 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 responsible for everything. He's no matter how you um, how you slice it, um, as great as the rest of the band is, you know, he's a front man. He's 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 a lead singer. So everybody's looking at him, you know, in the audience. Right. Absolutely. Well, they went on in 1984 to record a three-song demo tape called "The Last Rites," and uh, that featured uh, "Last Rites," "Love to Death." Same song, mm -hmm. Skull Beneath the Skin and Mechanics. So, um, and all of those were later added on to their full length release. But I think it's neat to, uh, interesting to find out that Carrie King of Slayer filled in on some on guitar for some of their shows in the San Francisco area. Oh, wow. When they, uh, when they were first playing. I thought that was pretty neat. Interesting. And then uh, Carrie King went back to Slayer and Megadeth replaced uh, Roush with uh, a jazz fusion drummer named Gar Samuelson. Oh yeah, very interesting. That's when he came into the yeah. band, along with New Yorker's uh, guitarist Chris Poland, and uh, Chris Poland, um, I actually uh, a friend of mine that played with us in the first incarnation of Scream King, uh, played with Chris Poland wow. at a uh, at a guitar center uh, Thing, yeah. session. So it wasn't it wasn't like he was in his band or toured with them or any anything like that. But I thought, you know, just kind of neat, you know. Now let me ask you, uh, Joe, as a Megadeth fan yourself, where does Chris Poland um, rank as a guitar player? Um, you know, your the reason I'm asking is it's kind of interesting. Um, Chris Poland, very much like uh, Gar Samuelson, he was much more of a jazz player from everything I've ever um, read. He's really not um, what you consider like a metal guy, and that's kind of what he brought into the band. But it's kind of interesting because he is the original guitar player. But there, there are guys that came after him. Probably the main one being like Marty Friedman, that was I think much more popular among the, um, you know, uh, metal fans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, he had his place in Megadeth, for sure. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like what he did. Yeah. And um, I think it was a good a good combination between him and Gar Samuelson. Um, you know, their, their styles kind of blended yeah. well, and they, they were able to make something work. And 1985, Killing is My Business, and Business is Good is proof of that yeah, yeah so this is where uh the band started to take their first real steps uh, as a professional band uh, for megadeth with combat records in 1985 
And uh, the label gave the band $8,000 to record and produce its debut album. And they ended up spending 4000 of that on drugs and alcohol. And oh, wow. So the band later fired the original producer and finished the recording themselves. So when you listen to that, that album, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good, uh, not, not to take any digs or cheap shots at them, but, you know, they were a bunch of young guys and relatively inexperienced at that time still too um and probably half drunk most of the time and who knows what else oh, yeah. and they finished and they finished this album was they and they were still able to pull, put it out but you can tell because you can listen you can listen to it and it doesn't for production value it doesn't hold up to the other albums oh yeah it would be interesting to see those guys go back and re-record that i, I think is what i'm getting at i hate to say it, joe but some of our favorite bands i mean you even go back to like um you know, bands like Aerosmith, Sabbath, um, Motley Crue, um, some of my favorite music, these guys were stoned out of their minds and yet made for beautiful music. I mean, I hate to promote that. Yeah, yeah some way they pull, you know, produ producers found a way to work with them and, and make it work. Yeah. Especially a guy like Absolutely. Nikki Six. look at how many hit songs that guy wrote and and half of the time he was, you know, stoned on heroin, you know. I, I mean, I've, I've heard him right. talk about... If people knew, if yeah. people knew with the business side of people of yeah. these bands these producers these these uh, studio engineers these managers and the shit that some of these people put up with and had to go through to get some of these crazy talented musicians to pull off the performances that was needed for a professional release you wouldn't believe it oh yeah i mean, I mean I, yeah there, there, there's horror stories that a lot of the stuff they don't let they don't get out and they don't want yeah. it to get out you know yeah. because it would hurt the reputation of the artist and blah 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 yeah i hear you people to think these guys these are these people are gods and keep buying the records yeah <laughs> so, yeah, yeah i hear rolling. you and yeah and you know but um for a debut album that wasn't a that wasn't a bad kind of um no it wasn't introduction to, for Meg for people to check out megadeth for the first time but i mean i i really got to say like um as we were talking, getting ready to do a show tonight online, um, probably um, the one album probably that I gotta say um, really introduced me, like a lot of people, to Megadeth was Peace Sells, the next album we're gonna get into. And so I put that in kind of my top three Megadeth albums, which I would say Peace Sells, just because that's the first album where I really got exposed to Megadeth. And then probably would be um, Countdown to Extinction, and then probably the number three would be Rust in Peace. Um, but, you know, Anything by Megadeth, I think, is really, um, really great. But those are kind of albums that stand out. Oh, absolutely! That's a classic, and uh, definitely one of my favorites too. Um, just great stuff and uh, killer album. Again, uh, eighty six, eighty seven, twenty five thousand dollar budget on Combat Records, yeah. and uh, this would be, uh, I think, their last on Combat Records or one of their last. And that's when they uh, ended up working. Uh, uh, starting to work with Capitol Records. Of all places, the very record company that uh, that um, the Beatles were on. I mean, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't, uh, and I didn't bring that up because they weren't really known for signing um, a lot of metal acts at the time, Capitol. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so, um, kind of interesting, Joe. And, um, you know, Megadeth, getting back to, like, Peace Sells, um, you, you got to really consider that was only the band's second album, They've just signed with Capitol, so they're, they're with like a major, la the first major label kind of album, and they got a lot more exposure, a lot more money. Not not as he just now the ex Metallica guitarist, but um, I mean at this point, you know Dave Mustaine's starting to get a little more popularity. He's the front man. He's getting out, and we have MTV at this point. And and I remember um, with this album, I mean, because Dave was getting really political, like he was really kind of ahead of his time before it was fashionable for all these people become woke and, you know, go out and give their political... He And what I respect about Dave is he gave his political view, but, but he never really got woke like a lot of these people. And he was kind of ahead of his time. Like, he'd go and give his views or, or he's more one of these guys, you know, well, vote however you were going to vote, but, get, you know, and that he's helped start that whole rock the vote thing, you know, so you got to give a guy credit. He was really... Um, yeah, yeah, he was, he was proactive yeah. with the, the political movement and things like that and uh, not just lyrically, but uh, yeah, yeah. right. And peace, Absolutely. peace sells. That became like a um, a big song because they started playing on MTV, and you, you would see it not just on it Headbangers. It became a staple. It became an anthem. It did. Yeah, not just on um, 
you know, not just on Headbangers Ball, like a lot of metal acts, you'd see them sometimes, it got so popular, it was even being played on the radio back then, it was being played, um, you know, throughout the day. Um, and even, it became so popular, just the music, that they use that for several years for um, the theme for MTV News. Yeah, yeah. Kurt Loader, this is the news. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Pete Sellers, Megadeth, uh, ventured out on tour with Alice Cooper on his when he was on his Constrictor tour. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, I think that was the beginning. Uh, we talked about this a little bit yeah, before yeah. with the Alice Cooper episode, that the relationship between Dave and Alice Cooper. So, um, and on this tour, they ended up having problems with uh, Chris Poland and Sam Wilson for their drug and alcohol abuse. Yeah. And uh, ended up parting ways. Now let me with those um, guys. before we move on. Let me tell you another interesting thing I um, learned about that today, Joe, and um, prepping for the show. Um, not only was Gar Samuelson um, let go because of his um, drug addiction, but he'd actually got caught um, selling off some of the band's um, you know equipment to try to use you know the funds from that to get um, drug money. If you can believe that, <laughs> he's lucky they didn't. Yeah. Um, He's lucky they didn't, you know, Dave Mustaine didn't press charges. He just, uh, just let the guy go, you know? <laughs> yeah, drugs, are, drugs do, do ugly things to people, man. Real ugly things. And, um, but they, they moved on, and uh, that's when uh, I think Jay Reynolds of Malice and uh, Jeff Young uh, came into the picture for uh, Megadeth's 88, 89 album, So Far, So Good, So Well. And that's an interesting um, lineup, an interesting album, because... Um, this guy, Jeff Young, he's got a huge, um, like, internet kind of fan base. I mean, um, he, he hasn't gone on to any kind of great success, but I see him um, being followed all, you know, on, on social media and stuff. And um, he's popular stuff, and he's put out, like, some soul albums. I mean, he, like I said, he's not had any kind of um, huge success, and he just played on, like, um, the one album. But um, that album actually um, featured a great cover they did of um, Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. And um, it also features a song in there called um, In My Darkest Hour, which um, I, I happen to understand that Dave Mustaine wrote um, like as a tribute to Cliff Burton because that was um, they'd record that album, I guess, um, right um, kind of after uh, Cliff Burton had been killed in that bus accident. Right. And, and it, it's one of those albums, it's the third album, but it, it didn't really receive a lot of um, fanfare. I mean, I remember hearing the, the cover of Anarchy in the UK all over metal radio at the time, but um, it wasn't a huge blockbuster like, uh, let's say, Peace Cells was. Right, yeah, it didn't, it didn't quite see the uh, smashing success. I mean, it, it did well, but yeah. it, was, uh, it, it, it missed the mark as far as where, uh, where they were. And, pre with the previous release and it, but on that on this album they uh they did a lot of touring and, yeah. and played a lot of shows and they did an american north american tour with warlock and a band called sanctuary whose debut album refuse denied is a cult classic that was produced by dave mustaine wow, wow. and uh we were fortunate enough to in scream king to play a show with them as they reunited and, and came through uh about you know, maybe two years ago i think yeah here in chicago oh interesting and, uh, yeah, they were phenomenal live. They were a great, great band. Good, good times. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm um, seeing the the one thing throughout the um, history of Megadeth. Let's be honest. Um, it's Dave Mustaine's band. He is he is Megadeth, and there's no way around it. That's that's why you know if anybody else had even you know considered the idea that when Dave wanted to kind of um, bring Megadeth to an end, any, any other guys want to even like toy with the idea of. Um, Oh, we're going to carry on as Megadeth. I mean, it would not have worked. He wouldn't have allowed it. But even beyond that, if um, they had been a, if they'd been allowed to even attempt it, you know, um, right? People would just be like, "No, Dave Mustaine is Megadeth," and and that's why when he decided he injured his arm and he decided he was going to take a break for a while, that's why he decided to kind of um, bring Megadeth in. And I, I think everybody knew that. Right, yeah. You know, and, and he gets a lot of slack for that, and I see both sides of the coin. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't personally know Dave Mustaine. I've no. never met him. No, I've heard that he can be a really difficult person to get along with. And, yeah. And he's very demanding and, and whatnot and whatever, but, uh, you know, he, he's very talented, and um, he knows what he wants, and he goes for it. I mean, uh, so I, I, I kind of see his point, you know, yeah. to, to a point, I do, and... Yeah. Um, you know, I commend him for that and sticking to his guns and doing what he thinks is right, whether whether other people think it is or not. Yeah. And um, 
you know, he knows what he, he knows what he wants out of the musical vision and out of the band and out of the performance and out of an album. And he's done nothing but improve every record, you know, and, and done a phenomenal job yeah, I mean, of it. So, um, yeah. but interestingly enough, we're now up to uh, the entrance of the drummer, Mr. Nick Menza. Yeah, yeah. Nick Menza joined Megadeth in 1989, and he was Chuck Baylor, Beeler, I don't know how to pronounce that yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. but that was the guy that he ended up replacing in Megadeth, and he was Chuck's uh, drum tech. Interesting. Wow. So, so very, and, and, and you know what? That's, that's happened more than people think it has. There's a lot of musicians that ended up getting the shot and that's how they got their shot. They, they were, they were a roadie or a tech for the band. Oh yeah. And an opening came up and they, they were slotted in. I got a, a, a good friend of mine that's actually Dave Mustaine's guitar tech. Wow. And, uh, we, we used to play shows, my band, his band years ago and, and uh, you know, he, he gets bombarded with people asking him for backstage passes. I bet, and, I bet, and yeah. Guitar picks and, and all that shit. So, you know, when I when I do, the few times that I do see him or run into him, you know, it's one thing I just, I don't even bring it up. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just, you know, he, he gets so sick and tired of, of hearing that, you know, and people hitting him up for stuff like that. Well, but, it's funny you say that because I know one other situation like that that not having anything to do with Megadeth, but... Um, the band Slaughter, when um, their guitar player Tim Kelly d died in a car accident, um, they they decided to carry on, and, and the guy they got to fill his place was um, his guitar tech, who was this guy Jeff Blando, who um, had Tim Kelly never died. You know, he may never got that opportunity. And in fact, um, I, I've heard him talk over years in interviews. He goes, "As great as it was to get that gig, you know, you got in the back of your mind that I wouldn't be getting this gig if you know the guy I worked for um, hadn't been killed in a car accident." <laughs> Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And interestingly enough, we uh, just to backtrack for a minute, we, yeah. we yeah. talked briefly about Jeff Young. Well, Jeff Young was let go around the same time as Nick Menzik's coming into the band uh. because Dave Mustaine uh, suspected him him of having an affair with Mustaine's girlfriend. Wow, which is a, which is an allegation that Jeff Young still to this day denies. But you know, it's a it's an interesting twist and turn of events to what we're at where we're at modern day Megadeth. And what's yeah, and, and it wouldn't be the first time something like that has happened. I mean, even again, nothing to do with Megadeth, just kind of um, to prove what right. you're saying there. I mean, I remember when, um, for anybody cared about who Richie Cotson was, getting kicked out of um, Poison for supposedly, um, you know, boinking uh, Ricky Rocket's fiance. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, boy. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. these things these things happen, but, but continue with your thought, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, so so uh, that led to some problems for them because they had a hard time replacing Jeff Young. Yeah. So that uh, put the band on a little bit of uh, a little bit of a uh, derailment for a little while, but uh, of course, uh, you know they they troopered on and uh, they were able to uh, get people uh, involved and, and move on and put out a ton more albums and stuff so but uh that leads me to one of my favorite albums with uh, nick menz that was rust in peace oh yeah and uh what a what a phenomenal album um just the musicianship the songs those guys were just those guys were all the chemistry was amazing they were firing on all cylinders just that's just a well, definitely hands down one of my favorite and, and i gotta interrupt you joe because um i totally agree and here's the thing um first of all as we were talking earlier about um, how great you know the first two Megadeth albums are, but I will say, I think uh, uh, most fans will agree that's kind of a lot of people will say that's the favorite lineup. I mean, it's interesting because um, just talking about that lineup for a minute, you got Marty Friedman and you got Nick Menza who came into the band, and so they're not even original members. A few people knew before Megadeth, um, kind of if you're a real metal diehard fan, um, you a little bit some some about who Marty Friedman was, but like Nick Menza was a total unknown and. He, he would um, be the drummer featured on most Megadeth albums, you know, up until the time he left. And in fact, I dare say that, um, you know, in fairness to uh, Gar Samuelson, he only played on two Megadeth albums, but I dare say that um, Nick Menza would kind of go on to become even more popular than the original drummer, which is really saying something. Yes, yes. But during all of this, uh, interesting to note that uh, 
Pantera drummer Vinny Paul was actually given the job to join oh, Megadeth. Wow. And um, he turned it down because they, uh, Dave Mustaine refused his request to also let his brother Dimebag in the band. Wow. So yeah. um, <laughs> he, who knows where that would have went. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, wow. And just think but, about uh, that, Joe, for a minute. That's something I never know. But just, okay, so um, if Dave Mustaine had uh, agreed to that, I mean, the first of all, Metal history in general would be quite different. I mean, uh, we not, might not have had Pantera go on to have the success they had. They might have been just part of metal history because they were part of um, Megadeth, you know? And, and think how different those records would have been. But, man, that that's something to think about. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Yep. And um, so so they uh, so they went on to offer Chris Olivia. The, the, the job, and, but he didn't want to leave Sabotage. Which makes sense, because it was kind of his baby with his brother, you know? Right. And then Jeff Loomis, uh, who would later go on to become the guitarist, the, the phenomenal guitarist in Nevermore, and now Arch cool. Enemy, yeah. um, also auditioned, but Dave Mustaine said he was too young because he was only 18 at the wow, time. Wow, wow. And then that led up to uh, Marty Friedman coming into the band. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's... Um interesting because you know people can say what they want about Dave Mustaine but I mean I think you got to try to even as a fan see things from his perspective especially after the way he was kicked out of um you know Metallica he's got to be thinking okay once he starts having a little bit of success with um you know Megadeth he's got to kind of be thinking you know this is this is my baby I'm you know I'm the main guy I gotta I gotta keep this going and I'm gonna do I'm gonna do whatever it takes to you know um to make this work, to make this thing, you know, to go as long as I possibly can. And so I definitely see things, you know, I think through Dave Mustaine's eyes, um, because, I mean, he's he's really the one guy, you go through all the lineup change, but he's the one guy been there since day one. Yep, exactly. Well, this album also featured Mike Klink. He was the uh, first producer uh, to not be fired in the Megadeth, <laughs> Megadeth and, ranks. And, and you, know who, uh, you know what he so, did before so, that? So that, again, once again... Yeah. You know, people don't realize that, but that, that's huge because uh, the work and the effort and the talent and time that a producer puts in also with the band uh, from inception to completion is a lot. So it, it's actually good to find the right guy and work with that guy. And Joe, do you know, um, do you know uh, previous to that what uh, Mike Klink was uh, known for producing? No, but I've heard the name. So Appetite for familiar. Destruction and, and the... Use Your Illusion album by, of course, Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's where I've heard the name. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So they, uh, so they ended up doing six videos for this for Rust in Peace. Yeah, yeah. And it hit the charts at number twenty three and number eight in the United United Kingdom. So here again, Megadeth find themselves, you know, getting some uh, some more popularity, some more critical acclaim, and. Uh, Rising up as the thra the thrash titans that they that they are known as today. And I think and this, al yeah. this album, I, I I dare say, really solidified that. Yeah, and, and see, I think by the time they get to that fourth album, I mean, um, that was that band's kind of like um, the debut of that lineup. But but you know what? It really after three albums kind of gave people, uh, you know, this is a solid band. This this is this is the band going forward. This is what it should be. And at that point in time. You had, um, the band was really on all cylinders. I mean, you had a great drummer, a great bass player. You had a great front man, a great guitar player. And and, and like I said, Dave Mustaine's a great guitar player, um, great singer and everything in his own right. But, you know, he could he could concentrate on being a front man and still do his rhythm guitar parts and leave, leave all the flashy lead playing to um, a guy like Marty Friedman. So, I mean, that's when the band was really kind of on all cylinders and everybody's kind of thinking after... All these lineup changes. Okay, this this is what the band should be going forward. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, they really picked up some steam with this with this release. And uh, like I said again, it's one of my favorite albums from them. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it received a Grammy nomination even in '91 for best metal performance. Yeah, and we should talk about that only because um, you know you and I have had these conversations before. But how many times? I mean, Megadeth, one of those bands, they're always kind of being. They get in a nod, like, I can't think of how many times they've been nominated for um, a Grammy, but more than once, and I don't know if they've actually won one, but um, it's kind of interesting, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. And um, so this album, uh, 
went on to really, I think, solidify them and give them what they needed. Give them kind of their metal cred, to, uh, so to speak. Push, yeah. you, you know, to put them, to separate them as one of the premier thrash metal bands out there. And, you know, they were touring with Slayer and Testament, Suicidal Tendencies, Judas Priest, Painkiller Tour. I mean, they... They got on all the all the goods, all the right all the right bills. And I think you know, know which is important as well. Yeah. You know, they they got on the right tours. I think. And I think too, Megadeth at that point, you know, with um, Rust in Peace, you know, uh, um, the debut album by that lineup. I mean, that was the right place for Megadeth. And um, I don't think while they were going through this that maybe Dave Mustaine or any of the guys in the band even kind of really realized that. But that's where uh, Megadeth really started, like getting on MTV. And I mean, I remember that. Um, I remember when they world premiered Hangar 18 video, seeing it, you know, for the very first time. I thought, yeah, now this is a band I can really um, kind of get into. Um, I mean, this is really um, something special, and um, and I don't think that Dave Mustaine or the guys at Megadeth at that point, or even at their record company, were really thinking, oh wow, we're we're on MTV. Maybe they were, but it was kind of something that just happened, kind of organically, natural. There was no kind of plan. Okay, we're going to go into the studio and we're going to. We're going to write a hit single. That's just kind of what came out. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's the way it should be, you know. Yeah. And uh, they're, just, they're just a phenomenal band. And every album after that, to me, has just uh, been pretty good, you know. They, they've had a couple clinkers in there that I wasn't a fan of, but uh, they come right back and uh, kick an ass with them. I, yeah. Album after album and putting out, you know, and the production continued to only improve and that's and that's due also to in part to technology and oh, yeah. uh, other things of course as well but uh you know they're 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 at a level now where they they could just do anything they wanted probably yeah as long as, as long as it says megadeth on it and i think they will at this point and, and and the the thing is i remember when they um david elson first came back to the band we'll get into that later but but um but before they really decided on solidifying the lineup there have been rumors and people have been kind of asking, why don't you guys get back the kind of Rust in Peace lineup together? And, and Dave Mustaine, to his credit, um, heard the fans calling and he, he made every effort to do that. But for some, some reason or another, it never went past the negotiations. I think I think the other guys wanted in the band wanted kind of more than what they were previously getting or like wanted an equal share of what Mustaine was getting. And he's like, no, no, you know, you've been out of the band or whatever, we're not going to do that. And so kind of negotiations fell apart. And sadly, with the passing of um, Nick Menza four years ago, um, there's very little chance that'll happen. I mean, maybe maybe, um, maybe one day Marty Friedman will be back or he'll step on stage with Dave Mustaine, who knows. But I think any hopes of that now are kind of um, really very little chance of that happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Uh Never say never, but yeah. you, you just don't know. Yeah. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, going back to uh, bringing up Nick Menza, um, in 92-93 they put out probably their most commercial biggest success, which was Countdown to Extinction. Yeah. And now this record, did you know Nick Menza was the one who came up with the title? I didn't know that. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Yep, so uh, hey, there's a uh, credit to him for that, so... And uh, they worked with Max Norman, famous producer, and uh, put out a uh, Billboard charting uh, double platinum. Oh yeah, that's one of my. That, that, that <laughs> might be like a strange coincidence of words put together that don't fit, <laughs> but but it, it worked. It, uh, that might be it received yeah. nomination for best metal performance mm -hmm. at the ninety three Grammy wow. Awards. And his title track won a Genesis Award from the Humane Society mm -hmm. for raising awareness for animal rights issues. Which I think that's pretty cool too. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, um, Dave Mustaine has um, all these little um, side interests, so that's kind of cool that he's able to use his vehicle with Megadeth to kind of um, promote some of that stuff. And, and I kind of right. dig, dig that because it's a new way to kind of, um, you know, uh, bring new people into the band and kind of, you know, promote what you're all about. And and if yeah. you um, agree with uh, Mustaine or not, I'll say one thing I, I've always respected about him. Um, he's one of these guys with. Um, He's not he's not a guy that I think will ever go woke or anything in the sense that with Mustaine, uh, what you see is what you get. He doesn't tell you necessarily what everybody um, wants to hear. He tells you what he really thinks, and, and you can believe whatever is coming out of his mouth. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right, yeah. 100%. And so in 92, they toured with uh, Pantera and White Zombie for this album. Wow. And interestingly enough, this was the first real serious, like, big-name concert that I ever went to. Oh, interesting. So uh, I got to see Megadeth, Pantera, and White Zombie in, uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Wow. It was a killer show. Yeah, 
I remember it vividly. And uh, Megadeth was definitely uh, ahead of the game. And in my uh, in my viewpoint, you know, Pantera was just phenomenal and loud and aggressive. But you know, Phil's voice was absolutely shot. Wow. Uh, and White Zombie, same thing. Rob Zombie was worried more about running around, acting like a cartoon character, <laughs> than he was singing. Wow. And um, Megadeth stole the show, in my opinion. That's, that's, that's so, amazing. But interestingly enough, something I wanted to bring up uh, about Marty Friedman. Um, Marty Friedman um, went to and taught at uh, GIT, Guitar Players Institute of Technology. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of my very close friends uh, and guitarists that passed away a few years ago, uh, Tony Galasso, uh, hands down one of the most talented guitarists I've ever worked with, um, also went to GIT wow. and met and knew Marty Friedman. Well, we were playing a show in Arizona, and uh, we were playing with Marty Friedman's old band, War Dog. Oh, wow. And um, all of a sudden, out of the blue, in walks Marty Friedman. Interesting. And uh, so my buddy and me are sitting at the bar, and Marty Friedman comes up there and sees him, and is like, Tony, and gives him a great big hug. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, does, that's, that's, he really does know Marty Friedman. That's Marty a cool story. Him. And before we go on, i got to say... Um, Marty Friedman, he's really, um, you know, he's really got a great, amazing story for so many reasons, but not just, it even goes way beyond Megadeth, because um, I don't know if you're even aware, Joe, but like, since leaving Megadeth, I mean, for over, I, I want to say 25 years now, um, he to since leaving Megadeth, he, he um, moved to Japan, he, he really immersed himself in the Japanese culture, he's fluent in, in being able to speak um, Japanese. He's a big pop star there. Um, he put out he puts out all these great solo albums, um, and he, he's he's got like he's on Japanese TV. I understand. So, I mean, he's he's doing bigger and better um, than you can even imagine, and he's still got a career oh, going yeah. over there. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's huge in Japan. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, just totally reinvented himself, and I guess I guess he left because. Um, Megadeth at that point, he, he kind of felt like he had reached the point, you know, where it was time to kind of move on to something else. But I mean, again, like we were saying, Marty Friedman, he, he's, um, I think, most people's uh, favorite uh, guitar player in Megadeth. I mean, he's probably um, got to be the most oh, popular, yeah. you know. And uh, the, yeah. the current that guitar player. just a yeah. monster guitarist, yeah. absolutely. In fact, like we're talking, I mean, that's our, uh, we got we got two Two albums that you and me cited from that lineup of a band that just, you know, it's on our top list, you know? Yep. Yeah. Yep, they're, uh, it's, a, it's hard to top those two, for sure, for sure. Yeah. And uh, Marty Freeman as a guitarist, yeah, just, you can't say enough that good things about him. The guy's just, he's amazing. Super impressive. Yeah, and, and I was reading that Nick, uh, Nick Menza left the band because, um, for, for several reasons, but the main one was he was like, diagnosed with some type of cancer um, back then and um, he'd injured his knee or something and was un unable to tour the band so um, originally it, it, they brought in this guy Jimmy DeGrasso who's uh, played like with Alice Cooper and Y&T and then they um, he ended up staying for a couple years but um, again Nick Menz I think he's the most popular drummer that's ever um, been in the band they got a new drummer now but like I don't to be honest I don't even know his name but but I remember Nick Menz because you know, he just made that kind of an impression on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's, were, uh, and it's sad, Nick, Nick Menza, you know, um, I was reading, um, he, he, he died like four years ago. What's amazing, I don't think people realize, um, he died like pretty much um, when he was on stage. I mean, um, he had this new band called OHM. I never really listened to the band. Or, uh, but um, they were just kind of getting their start. And they were playing like in Los Angeles, this little club. And three songs into the set, he started having chest pains, and he just kind of literally collapsed on stage. And by the time the ambulance came, he was he was dead, and it was massive like um, heart failure. Yeah, that's just terrible. And he, he, he wasn't kind of, kind of reminds you of the, I mean, not really, but similar uh, to uh, Dimebag. You know, yeah, I mean, dying the difference stage, of, you know? the difference obviously one is a natural death, and one one you're murdered on right, stage. Of course, but right. but um, yeah. But yeah, could, nonetheless, what I mean is yeah. dying in the middle of a performance. I mean, wow. You know? And could you imagine uh, being Jeez. a fan at that show and kind of like, oh wow, my, you know, the guy, the guy that I came to see, or you know, um, he's the reason I came to see this band. Um, there, he's he's gone. Right. Yeah. So what right. a what an awful what an awful way to go. And um, but again, um, 
he's he's remembered fondly by the Megadeth fans, and and, and he's kind of got a lot going on because I hear that there's um. He had a book or something that he was writing. I, I'm not sure if that came out, but I, I know that there's a documentary coming out. So that's something that people have to look forward to, I guess. And that's been put yeah. together by his family, from what I understand. Yep. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, after that, uh, after Countdown to Extinction, they uh, ended up uh, putting out Youth in Asia that had uh, some floor temple stuff, but some really good stuff, yeah. too, as well. And uh, they had some problems with the studios there in Arizona. And ended up building their own studio there, which they ended up recording a lot of stuff at now. Uh, I th- I, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, I'm sort of confident in saying that probably almost everything since Euthanasia, they've done s- at least pre-production tracks at this studio called Fat Planet and uh, Hangar 18. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a, a warehouse that they turned into a studio in Arizona. Oh wow, that that that's 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 unique, and um, you you know the thing is too, um, in regards to um, Megadeth, they've had a lot of um, guys in and out of the band, and, and one guy they had um, when Dave Elson wasn't in the band was um, James Lomenza, who was most people know as a bass player um, in White Lion, and he he played um, with Zach Wilde in uh, Black Label Society and Pride and Glory, and. Um, and we're going to get in talking about what's going on now with um, Megadeth, but um, I think um, James Lomenzo, to me, I think um, maybe he's a guy that would be perfect um, bass player to step into Megadeth right now. And, of course, what the elephant in the room, uh, Joe, what we're talking about is Dave, David Ellison um, being kicked out of Megadeth. And I guess um, most people know why, that he alleged that he was um, online, there's a video. He was kind of touching himself or something with an underage girl at the time when this when the film was allegedly made. So when you heard the news of this, uh, what was your initial thought? Well, my initial thought was, uh, you know, here we go. You know, they turned, they've managed to turn heavy metal into um, a mudslinging uh, similar to what you get in politics. Yeah, yeah. And now the only reason I'm going to say this is, you know. Now, for the most part, in my opinion, yeah. which mean, I know means almost nothing, uh-huh. but in my opinion, this is an issue that should have been dealt with Private. between Dave Ellison, this individual, uh-huh. and his wife, yeah. and nobody else. It was nobody else. It's nobody else's business whatsoever. Well, here's, yeah, so yeah. If, if Dave Ellison is showing up at the job yeah. and doing what he's asked doing what he's supposed to do and doing his job and playing the parts, uh, contributing creatively, whatever, whatever he's supposed to be doing. And if he's doing that, who cares what he's doing in this personal life? It's nobody's business. Well, I, you know, I, yeah. I mean, what about, what about, okay. What about Dave Mustaine when he kept falling off the wagon, getting drunk and doing embarrassing and saying ridiculous fucked up shit to people and all the stuff that that guy's been through or some of the other guys like Gar Samuelson or Chris Poland you know some of the things that they how, how much you know how many how many uh, whoops the daisies did they get you know it is a heavy metal band let's remember that yeah, yeah I mean and how many how many people you know and I'm not saying that this is right I'm not yeah, condoning it yeah. but how many times has this happened and nobody gave a shit and nobody even heard about it yeah I mean nobody, yeah. Ever, nobody even ever said anything about it I, yeah. So you know, so so to a point, I, I kind of think that Dave Ellison got the shaft. You know, now I'll go on to say this yeah. because Megadeth released a statement on their website, and I think this is the important thing to take from this more than any of the other stuff combined. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to read it note for note, right from right off of Megadeth's website. Great, Joe. Okay, he says, while we do not know every detail of what occurred. With an already strained relationship, yeah. what has already been revealed now is enough to make working together impossible moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's there's tension in the band without this uh, situation coming up. So so what that tells me is that this was this was their easy way of cutting the cord with Dave Ellison. Yeah. This was their easy way to just 
just get it over with. So what? Maybe they're not dealing with it. Maybe they're not talking about it. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's little piddly stupid shit. They're not. They're not uh, elaborating. They're not telling you. They're just saying with an already strained relationship. Okay. Well, how is the relationship strained? Is it financial? Is it you know? Is it creative differences? I mean, there, there's. There's a lot of room there in that statement. Mm -hmm. So I would urge and ask people to remember that and think about that. You know, it's not it's not so much that, okay, hate Dave Mustaine or hate Megadeth yeah. um, because they kicked Dave, they fired David Ellison. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me like that there's more to it than just this situation that led Megadeth to decide to part ways with Dave Ellison. See, see, Joe, you've already done more than uh, most people as far as reading between the lines there. But, um, but the thing, that's, the thing is that I, the little bit that I've been reading up on is okay. For, first of all, um, when I, I think um, a huge part of this may be on Elson's part. I mean, he's not—he didn't fire himself. But um, as far as the strained relationship is, um, when Dave Mustaine got back um, together with Megadeth, you know, I think in 2004 when he first put the band back together after taking some time off because he had, supposedly had an arm injury he did it without ellison and then so ellison sued him um and he, and then he ended up losing his lawsuit and had to pay dave mustaine a lot of um money and then um supposedly him and mustaine um ran into each other and they had a conversation and um and dave mustaine said yeah that's what you get for um suing me but they eventually kind of patched up their differences and by 2010 uh, ellison was back in the band but at that point, the only way they had like an out of court settlement where he didn't have to finish paying to Dave Mustaine whatever the court ordered him to, but Mustaine told him, "Okay, but the only way I'm going to let you back into the band is you're not going to own a piece of the name. It's I'm going to own um, the Megadeth name, and you're just going to be a salaried employee." And so, I guess at that time, you know, because um, he lost a lot of money with the lawsuit and not being in Megadeth for a few years. He agreed to come back, and that's probably, um, on his part, that was probably a kind of um, sour note that, you know, he used to own 50% of the Megadeth name now, um, Dave percent, you know, Dave Mustaine owned 100% um, of it, so I know that was a little bit of a, um, you know, thing oh, between sure them. Oh, sure, that was a, was a sore spot, and that makes a lot of sense, because now, you know, I've read that, I don't know the exact details yeah. of it or anything like that, I don't think that that's being released, really. But Dave Ellison does have a couple of different lawsuits in place um, with this whole situation. Yeah. You know, the uh, the apparent alleged uh, relationship uh, with the with the minor or whoever yeah. it was. There's a, there's a lawsuit with that, and there's a lawsuit with uh, going on between him and Megadeth. So yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see um, how that all develops and what, what happens. But I just wanted to bring this up, and not as a dick to Dave Mustaine yeah. or a dick to Megadeth, but to put things into perspective for people, because I think that needs to be done. Uh, Dave Mustaine actually... Uh, fired Nick Menza from the band yeah, yeah. because he believed that Nick was lying about having cancer. Oh, wow. So this is the kind of person you're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm sorry to say that, but seriously, I mean, I don't know the, again, I don't know all the details about that, so I'm not going to get too crazy carried away about it, but that's pretty fucking shitty, man. Yeah, and you know, and, it, it's uh, odd because I know, remember... The, the, later on, the guy mm. ends up dying. I mean. yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that because it, it's funny that... Um, because people were wanting, you know, Marty and Nick to come back. He tried to negotiate it, but um, never uh, agreed to give them, like, the money they were asking for or anything for whatever, you know. I guess, again, you're the one guy in the band since day one. You, you think you deserve the most. Um, maybe rightfully so or not. But, um, and like you said, I remember hearing that back at the time that he didn't. He thought, oh, something's going on with Nick. I don't think he really does have cancer. And then, of course, when it's announced that, you know, Nick Menza he dies on stage and collapses... You know, he was saying, ever since then, he's been like, oh, I just always loved Nick. He was a great guy. So, I mean, of course, you're not going to say, you know, if you if um, you want to look good to your fans, you're not going to say anything negative about a guy that just, you know, dropped dead. So, I mean, that right. would be pretty stupid. <laughs> but um, ever since yeah. then, he hasn't said a bad word about him. And I guess, again, <laughs> why would you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so at least that's that's my two cents. Like yeah. I said, re really, it's pretty. It's a pretty personal thing. Yeah. Whether it's wrong or right, people can make up their own minds or their own morals about that. Yeah, I'm no. not going to go there. Yeah, I will. But, I like will. Like I said, yeah. when it comes to business, 
yeah. and dealing with uh, being in a heavy metal band. I think that that's something that should be between him and his wife and his family, and they should be working that out. Not everybody else, not the fans, not the public, yeah. not the band. So I honestly think that this was uh, Megadeth or Dave Mustaine's way of dealing with other issues that were going on that they weren't happy with or that Dave Mustaine was not happy with. Yeah, now, they're, yeah. Again, they're not elaborating yeah. on that, but he kind of hints towards that. And now here, here's a few other things I'd like to add, you know, in regards to my opinion on the matter. Um, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Joe, but here's the thing. I mean, like it said in the Megadeth um, statement, there's a lot of things we don't know about this little incident now. I think where Elson made some mistakes is, um, again, we don't know the whole story, but um, like I, I can safely say you, um, I don't think you or me ever got caught doing something like that. And the thing is, where he made the mistake is being idiot enough to put something like that um, on video or whoever's idea it was. Okay, and then yeah. and then the other thing where I think he mis made his mistake is um, he's not totally denying the charges. In other words, like he's come out and said, okay, it was a stupid thing that was done, but He's making it more of an issue about um, about the fact that somebody stole the videotape and put it out there. And I guess if you want to go over after him for that, but um, you know you can do that. But th there's still the fact that you know it's on video supposedly. And then and and I don't think um, I don't think they would you know maybe they would fire him if um, maybe there'd be something to it. I mean the fact that supposedly the girl's underage now she she's gone online and made a statement in regards to. You know she's eight. Yeah, she's eighteen now. But I supposedly when this happened, she was you know um, underage. And I, and I think instead of um, you know coming out and making like really a proper statement, Ellison's just talking about oh some guy stole this tape and put it out there. And you know if I was a Kardashian. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna call Joe back. The call dropped. Um, funny how that happens. But um, so we're waiting for Joe to answer the phone. Yeah, 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 well, um, that, that's all right, Joe. Um, it's funny, funny when the call decided to drop in. But as I was saying, I think you know. This is, that, that, that must have been, that's, that, that's proof to everybody that this is live. This is yeah. unrehearsed. Yeah. Me and Jason don't get together and work all this out and, and look all this stuff up and think of this all in advance. This is this is live, as live and raw as you get. This oh is yeah. Just me and Jason, two two dudes talking about metal. Yeah, I, I like I like that because a lot of times uh, people ask me, you know, do you edit your interviews and. And I don't just because I don't have the equipment to, to be honest, but I like it that way too because. Me too, me too. Because it's, well, it's go on, as is. Go on if we can for just a minute here. This brings uh, uh, up Megadeth to a to a very strange point because in 2000 they released my least favorite Megadeth album called Risk. Okay. And uh, honestly, I'll give my two cents on this. I think this was Megadeth trying to jump on the bandwagon. Like Metallica did. Yeah. When they seen Meta the huge success that Metallica had and the money that was rolling in, Negative said, we can do this too. Now, they can, say, they can deny that all they want, and they can say whatever they want, but it's kind of strange and funny how the Black Album comes out and Metallica has this massive success with it. And then right afterwards, yeah, yeah, Megadeth doing the same thing, or trying to do the same thing. And, and, and oddly so, enough, it, that was Marty Friedman's... Oddly enough, that's Marty Friedman's final album. I think that had a lot to do with his decision to leave the band because they had gone off in such yeah. a drastic different uh, direction. And as a guy in the business yourself, Joe, um, that's very much um, probably true. But how much of a um, how much of a role do you think the record company played in saying, "Okay, uh, Dave, hey, you see what Metallica did with their Black Album? Why don't you go and do something like that?" Well, obviously, of, co of course, that was a huge part of it. That, that's always a part of it. Yeah, yeah. You know when that was. You know, in 2000, there was, there was still such thing as a record industry. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, these people are investing and taking big risks and putting a lot of money in these bands, like large amounts of money, uh -huh. hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, you know, to, to minimize those risks and maximize those payoffs, you know, they're going to do whatever it takes and whatever they think is going to work. So if there's something that they think is... We can incorporate this into your band or that in your band. We're going to cut your hair. We're going to do this. Yeah. We're going to do that. You know, when you're talking these major labels and stuff like Capital, they have a lot to do with that. Absolutely. Oh yeah. yeah. So um, they're protecting their investment. So um, you know, they're you know, Dave Mustaine and the band um, 
try and blame the producer and their, or their manager, yeah. you know, for this for this risk album. And you know, ultimately, it was their choice. They went they went ahead with it. They agreed with it. They put the album out. And in my my opinion, it was an absolute fucking turd. I think it was and, the uh, one album in so their career that really right, when, kind of was. And what's, inter- and what's interesting, and I don't know how true this is, because I would love to ask Marty Friedman about this. Dave Mustaine said that he told Marty after Risk that we had to go back to our roots and play metal again. And Marty quit. Wow. You know, well, I, I wonder if that's true to what point, because Marty is, is still putting out metal albums. He oh, yeah. still put out a... a, a some solo stuff that's metal. I mean, he's done some other stuff too, yeah, but uh, he, he's still a metal player. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so I don't know how true that actually was. You know, I would love to... I would love to get Marty's opinion on that. And as funny as it sounds to say this, I, I, I'm willing to bet, um, because he's such a huge pop star now in Japan, I mean, his career's totally... Um, gone off in a different direction, but I dare say as a solo artist and being that huge just in Japan... Um, probably makes a lot more money even than he was as a as a sideman in um megadeth i mean he gets every you know he gets all the songwriting royalties everything he's doing now you know every time um, one of his songs gets played on japanese tv and, and japan is very interesting because um even a band like mr big with billy Sheehan, um i mean they they were as big as the beatles from what i understand in, in japan and um even all these years after um the band doesn't play here in the united states that much but from what i understand about you know, typically they'll play like four or five shows a year in Japan and they'll just make bank, you know, and then the other guys can go do their other projects. But um, it really is totally amazing that I, I, I'm sure he makes a lot more money even than he was in Megadeth, if you can believe that. Probably, probably yeah. so. Yeah. And it's interesting, you, you just asked the question, uh, yeah, how, how much of a role do you think the label had, you know, in, in shaping the band's direction and stuff? Well, yeah. after the Wrist album and tour, Megadeth parted ways with Capitol Records in July of 2000. And according to Dave Mustaine, it was due to ongoing tension hmm. with Capitol Capitol's management. So who's to blame, so really? Right tells you, yeah. tells you that's, that's a big part of it, obviously. So, that was yeah. a huge part of it. So, so yeah, so what t- that tells me, too, is so maybe maybe Mar- Marty Friedman got wind of the fact that Megadeth was being dropped. Okay, they're now without a label, so now this is my time if I want to go do something else. To move on. Yeah, it could, have, it could have been a lot of things. I think that there, I think, you know, it's, it probably wasn't any one thing. But yeah. You know, that probably contributed to it. And it, it's interesting, too, because um, that one album, I think, is really the one stinker in the whole Me- uh, Megadeth catalog. And ever since then, every, right. everything they put out other than that is pretty pretty good. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. That was their, that was their one uh, misguided uh, effort. <laughs> attempt or their, their detour. But, uh, you know, that's okay. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, it happens. They've managed to put out every, every album since then, and several albums before then were amazing. And, and so, yeah. uh, that's, that's what we should focus on, that's what we should look at, and that's what I recommend people listen to and give a chance to, and uh, yeah. there's yeah. A, lot of, a lot of good negative stuff And say, say what you will about Dave Mustaine, but I think that proves not only what a great leader and frontman he is, but um, how very focused he is. I mean, he's one of these guys... That he's he's got a vision and and um, and and that's the one time you know with that one risk album that he kind of you know went off a little bit but ever since then he's been right on track and so you can't really deny with um, how successful he's been you know at that and and Megadeth continues to carry on so he's doing something right I mean at this point as we're talking here doing this uh, Megadeth had a 38 year career I, I was um, reading that today and. Um, I want to go back just for a minute, Joe, because as we were talking, the call dropped. And what I was saying was, um, getting back to David Ellison's exit from Megadeth, I think he could have handled things on his part a little differently. Had he, like he, I was reading something where he said, oh, you know, if I had been a Kardashian, um, this would have, this would have been forgotten about. It would have been all right to have a, some kind of a sex tape. And I think what he would have been better off to is kind of just, kind of um, saying, okay, you know, had this situation. I'm sorry. This is what you know. This is what happened. But then the other thing is, um, I don't know if you've read his book or that. But um, he, outside of Megadeth, for several years, he's also a, um, he's a pastor. He's a minister. So you got that angle as well. That people say, "Oh, wait a minute. You're in this band, Megadeth. Um, you know, you, you you claim you're a pastor, and you and you and again, we all fall, like you say, Joe. But um, so I think 
we have that angle as well. And the fact that supposedly when this took place, I think this is my main issue, is the girl was supposedly underage, and it doesn't matter she's 18 now, if, you know. And so I think there's certain things about the case we don't know, and the fact that he's um, got a lawsuit against the guy um, who supposedly leaked it, I don't know. what that would be interesting to see how that turns out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, and the, and and the big thing is is uh, there there is there is a lot that we don't know. Yeah. There is a lot of uh, misleading information out there, and information that there's gaps in the in the whole thing that uh, people don't know. Maybe we won't. Maybe we won't know. But uh, like I said, it's uh, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it, and um, you know, don't uh, don't penalize the band. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, Check out their new release when it comes out, and um, I'm sure it'll be amazing. And you know, um, Dave Ellison will be just fine. Um, yeah, yeah. He'll get on his feet. He'll do something else, and he always he always has, and he always will. And, 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 and uh, maybe you know, nobody's yeah. nobody's perfect, and hopefully he learns from this and he comes out the other side of it a better man and uh, learns from his mistakes. And, and and maybe if he does something else, maybe it'll be as big as Megadeth. Maybe it won't. Probably not. But let's get let's let's wait and see, and then we can. Uh, and we can judge judge for ourselves. But um, the other thing with all this um, that, that kind of um, got me wondering is, okay, from what I've heard, the Mega, new Megadeth album is supposedly going to come out this year. Um, really near, uh, they've pre got pretty much uh, most recording done now. I'm curious, do you think um, Dave Mustaine would go to the, the um, point of saying, okay, we don't want David Elson anywhere around this album, so we're going to have all the bass parts... Um, re-recorded by somebody else, or do you think they'll leave it as is? Boy, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a difficult thing to say, because, again, you're talking about uh, money, <laughs> a major heavy hitter professional band with uh, multi-page contracts. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, maybe, they, maybe they'll maybe they leave the uh, track as is because of legal reasons. Maybe they have to. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm yeah, yeah. saying, um, that could be anybody's guess. Maybe, you know, if, it, if it's up to Dave Mustaine, maybe he'll just delete it all and do it and lay the bass tracks himself. I mean, yeah. he's a competent musician. He could probably do that. Um, or, or he could hire someone else, you know. Uh, that's kind of what, um, you lot, know. A lot of possibilities there, but uh, another thing I want to bring up yeah. about Dave Mustaine is during the early 2000s, he was diagnosed with uh, radial nerve neuropathy damage and couldn't even make a fist with his left hand. Yeah, he yeah. He also had a kidney stone removed. And then later on, uh, further down the road, he ended up uh, defeating cancer. So uh, the guy's been through a, a, a lot of shit. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and um, I think too, um, on a religious angle, that supposedly Dave Mustaine is also a born again Christian. So people have been saying that kind of yeah. has has a role in this as well. You know, his beliefs on on you know him doing something while well, he's he's a married man and all this. So um, who 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 really knows? But um, you know, on, on that angle, if you were to re-record the bass parts, that, that's what they did, you know, um, Sharon and Ozzy on some of those early um, albums that Randy Rhodes um, played on. They left Randy's playing, but because um, the drummer and the bass player were suing them, you know, for, for songwriting royalties, they just said, okay, we're going to bring in, like, Robert Trujillo and, and the Faith No More drummer, Mike Borden. They're going to re-record all the bass and drum tracks. And, and I, I personally, as a fan, didn't like that because I'm like... Um, well, I guess that's one way of getting around it, saying, okay, we're going to take off their performing on the album so we don't have to pay them anything. But um, as a fan, I kind of feel like you're messing kind of with um, a classic, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say. And maybe maybe Ellison uh, contributed some songwriting. Maybe yeah, yeah, he didn't. Yeah. I don't know, you know, what, what Dave Mustaine is the 100% shareholder of Megadeth. Maybe that's in the contract that anything you contribute belongs to him and belongs to negative. And that's that. You know, yeah, and here's an ironclad contract like that. I don't know. And here's a fun part of a conversation to have now. Um, and then I kind of knew this was a rumor from the get-go, but shortly after all this broke and it was broke that Ellison was kicked out of the band again, um, people were going online saying Jason Newstead was going to join Megadeth. And I knew, I knew first of all, um, that probably was BS for, for a lot of reasons, but, but mainly because I've been reading stuff that um, I guess Jason Newstead was at one point asked to come back to um, Talc, and he, and he didn't for whatever reason, but he's been saying how he cannot physically um, play those Metallica songs like he, he once did up on stage. And so 
I thought, no, okay, if he's putting out that kind of statement, there's no way he's going to join a band like Megadeth because their their songs are just as aggressive as any of the stuff he did with Metallica. So I kind of knew from um, day one, but it got so out of control that his um, Jason Newstead's wife kind of because I guess Jason Newstead's nowhere on social media, but his wife is, and so she put out a statement. Listen, he's nowhere on social media. He's not joining Megadeth. We just want to put that out there. That's kind of how out of control this all got in just a few days. Right, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's fans being wishful or hopeful, you know, maybe, but uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah, he's got some health issues and health problems, and he's not he's not able to do that, uh, the, 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 the rigorous physical demands of that are too much on him. So, um, so uh, you won't uh, see that. Now, I'll say this much. You know, maybe, maybe somehow, some way, Dave could talk to him and have him come in the studio. Like you said, if if he ends up getting rid of Dave Ellison's bass tracks, maybe they can have Jason, Jason Newstead come in and record some stuff. Well, maybe that would be easier for him to actually do. I don't know. Yeah, that no, yeah. that that would be an interesting uh, that would be an interesting take. I I, I would even love to see that because I I'll tell you, um, I think my favorite era of. Um, you know, when I first got into Metallica, it was really around Master of Puppets, and you know, of course, sadly, Cliff died on that tour. That's really when I first became a, a Metallica fan. But um, after that, I say my favorite era of the band was all the stuff they did with Jason Newsted. I haven't really uh, been a fan, of, a big fan of the Robert Trier era stuff. I mean, I thought their um, last album um, was kind of a return to a you know metal sound, and I. I that's probably one I like the best of the current lineup, but um, so I, I would love to see that. But who are some other guys that you you think could fill that vacant um, base spot in Megadeth? Well, you know, interestingly enough, you brought up James Lomenzo. Oh. Um, I think that, that guy sounded great with him. I mean, uh, I could see that being uh, you know a reasonable a reasonable uh, good matchup for him. And um, you know. At the point where Megadeth's at in their career, I don't think it's going to be an issue or a problem for yeah. them to find a really good bass player to tour with. Oh, yeah. I don't think that, that that I don't think that will be the problem whatsoever. Oh yeah, so, and, uh, no, whoever uh, they get is going to be good, and uh, it's kind of almost almost insignificant. I don't, I don't mean to, I don't mean to say that the bass player is insignificant, but yeah. I mean but they, whoever they get will be professional and be very good. I'm, I'm sure. Well, again, so, um, again, but what's like, more yeah. interesting is. You know, the future. Yeah. What are they going to do? Is, is this guy, whoever steps into this role, you know, it obviously is going to be a hired gun yeah. um, at that point. And then, um, you know, is that person going to join Megadeth or will they be able to put aside their differences and reconcile and continue on with Dave Ellis? Yeah, I, I, I really, I and, mean. In the future. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe that will happen. That would be nice, but I don't see it at this point. But yeah, who, who knows? Like, as you say, never. Um, Never say never, but I, I think, again, James Lomenzo would be kind of obvious choice. I mean, as far as if you were asking my opinion, but I, I think knowing Dave Mustaine, not knowing him, but just being a fan, things I've seen over the years, he likes to kind of pick, you know, these hot up-and-coming people and kind of um, shine a light on them. I mean, again, uh, you look at somebody like James Lomenzo, I mean, um, before he was in, you know, Megadeth, probably everybody thought of him as a bass player from White Line. He would ever think you have the bass player from White Lion and Megadeth, but see, it, it works so well. Um, I think you're yeah. going to pick somebody like that. I mean, um, before we wrap this up, i got to ask you, because probably um, the other guitar player that I think I like the most in Megadeth uh, next to Marty Friedman would be the current guitar player, um, Kiko Larrero. I mean, he's, um, I forget where he's from. He's Brazilian or something, but just super amazing um, good guy. And I think what Dave Mustaine likes about him, besides his obvious talent, is... Um, he played on the last album, Dystopia, and he's he's gonna be on the new one. Yeah, but. he was in a band called he was in a band called Angra, and he's from Brazil. Yeah, phenomenal guitar player. And I think and, it, yeah. uh, real quick, interesting story that ties in with Kiko. Um, our bass player Tim Miller played with Kiko in Japan. Oh wow! And before Kiko got the gig with Megadeth, okay, um, there's a guitarist named Rusty Cooley, and Rusty's a phenomenal, amazing guitar wizard in his own right. Yeah, yeah. And Oh, interesting. And but, yeah. He thought about it for a while and he turned it down. And I'm like, Rusty, holy shit, dude. 
you turn down and join the Megadeth? Why? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, 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 I couldn't help myself. I had to ask him why. Yeah. And um, he told me, he said, you know, that he's just uh, such a passionate musician and, and guitarist and writer, songwriter, that he couldn't see himself going out, you know, on a big tour and playing somebody else's songs. It's like joining a cover band to him. Yeah. Even though it would be a very well paid cover band or, you know, whatever, a, a, a great gig. He just couldn't couldn't bring himself to uh, to play somebody you know a whole night of somebody else's music over and over and over and over again and not do his own thing. Yeah, because passionate, true musician, true songwriter. Yeah, because because the Dave Mustaine's credit, I will say, he's got a real knack for choosing talent. You know, as far as guys that um, that have been in the ranks of Megadeth over the years, and I mean. Um, like he had Al Petrelli on one album for um, "The World Needs a Hero," and he went on to have huge success with "Sabotage," as you and I were talking, and Trans Siberian Orchestra, and played with Alice Cooper. So he, he gets guys from all over. And Kiko Larrera, I think, what uh, Dave likes about him, besides his obvious talent, is he knows his place in Megadeth. And I think that's a lot of the reason you're not going to see Dave Mustaine get a maybe get a guy like Jason Newstead from an established band because. Um, they might expect to get a, you know, well, hey, I, I'm an established player too. From, you know, I came from, you know, let's say Jason, say I, I came from Metallica, so I should, you know, get just as much as I was getting in Metallica. Well, I don't, no, I don't think so. It probably would be Dave's, Dave's answer, and I think rightfully so because again, let's be honest, Dave Mustaine is Megadeth. I think uh, Megadeth can do anything at this point as long as he's front and center. Yeah, you know, and it's funny you brought up, you know, real quick, you brought up. Uh Nick Menza and Marty Friedman coming back into the into the fold, and they and Dave Mustaine actually tried that. He yeah, listened yeah. to uh, the fans, and uh, Just he tried out. to do that with uh, Nick Menza and both and Marty Friedman and David Ellison the first time Ellison departed, and David Ellison and Marty Friedman they were not able to come to an agreement, but Nick Menza did begin rehearsals of Megadeth yeah. for the System Has Failed album. And he said that uh, Nick wasn't up to the task and could not play the songs uh, for a demanding U.S. tour, so he was let go before it ever started. And that's the so, point he got um, Chris Broderick. Um, what did you think of him as a player? I love Chris Broderick. Uh, he's a great person and he's a phenomenal guitar player. From Jag Pans, and yeah, the guy's, the guy's awesome. I mean, just super, super good guitar player. I would love to do something with Chris Broderick. Yeah, yeah he's a great guitarist. And... Uh, Chris Poland also played some solos on uh, that album. The, the system has failed. Yeah, he, yeah. He returned. He made a return to Megadeth uh, in a slight way there as well. Yeah, and, and he played on that album. I haven't heard that entire album, but what I remember is I, I think David just kind of put that album out. I think he did a couple of live shows with like um, didn't even really have an official line. Just got some guys to go. I, I don't even remember who it was to go out there and do some live shows, but then. He got really serious about putting Megadeth back together, and I think at that point, you know, he was trying to prove that, you know, like I said, uh, Megadeth is um, Dave Mustaine. But I think you also have to have the right players in the band. And I think, I think maybe if he had even a return, like, hey, if Chris Poland go out on the road with him, they could have got some other guys because because then at least you would have had two of the original members, you know, from the band. But but again, probably came down to money and Chris Poland saying, well, if we're going to do that, then. Then since I'm the second original um, guy in the band, then I should get at least, um, you know, a little bit more money than what I was getting when I was fired from the band. Right, right. Yeah, so it's uh, it's anybody's guess, you know. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, like, I said, like we talked about once before, too, you know, there's not too many of these uh, old-school titans left out there still. So regardless of all the, all the gossip and all the bullshit yeah. and all the personal drama, you know, uh, as music as music fans, you know, put all that stupid shit aside for the most part, yeah. and just enjoy the music. You know, because life is short, and we don't know how many more albums uh, from these guys we're gonna get. You know, so I would urge people to just j jump in. You know, jump in yeah. at first and uh, really, really enjoy the music, and that's that's what matters. You know, the legacy that they're leaving behind yeah. is uh, is what it's all about. And if they go on tour, man. Go out and hug somebody, man. COVID's over. It's yeah. okay. You can go outside, poke your head out the window, hug somebody, shake somebody's hand, move on with your life. Yeah, I, I don't think... Um, but let, let's, yeah. let's go to some concerts and let's have some fun. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great place to kind of wrap this up because um, 
I, I do hear this new album's supposed to come out this year in spite of all this, and I don't think it's going to come out until Dave Mustaine knows that he can, you know, uh, do some live shows. Because because what's the point of putting out a, a, a an album that's you know been in the making for this long um, without being able to get out there and uh, tour and promote it? But um, yeah, so I, I just in on this Joe too that um, I would say the big the the so called big four bands um, probably Metallica, Megadeth be be my top two, then maybe Anthrax. I I'm with you because you and me have had this conversation for. I have a respect for Slayer because of what they, what they've done and what you know the success they've had. But um, outside of the fact that you know maybe being a little impressed with the screeching vocals, um, that's really not my thing. And I think part of the reason I like the other three bands um, so much are you can listen to an Anthrax song or, or a Megadeth song or Metallica song, and they they've got some kind of melody. You know, it sounds it's more than just screeching vocals. Yeah, yep, absolutely. But just to give, give you, a, 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 again, just a real quick, go back to the, keep it this in perspective with this whole situation with lawsuits and Ellison yeah. uh, being let go from the band and all of that. Uh, in 2004, Dave Ellison sued Dave Mustaine yeah, for $18.5 yeah. million dollars mm -hmm. in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, alleging that Mustaine shortchanged him on profits, including tour merchandise and publishing royalties. So the suit was dismissed in 2005, and Mustaine filed a countersuit alleging that Dave Ellison had used the band's name in an advertisement for music equipment. The suit was settled out of court. Yeah, yeah, that's so it sounds what, like these two guys have been duking it out, going back and forth uh, over money. That's and, what we were uh, talking about earlier. Stuff. Yeah, that's what we were so talking about time. earlier. So I again, I I, I I regress to my previous statement there. Uh, I think that that definitely plays a part in what's happening. I think it's a lot more than just this alleged affair uh, that, that took place. So I think uh, I think there's some things like that going on behind the scenes that they're probably not at liberty to talk about right now because yeah. it's in the process of happening and they both probably lawyered up. Yeah. So you know, there, there, there's a lot more to it. Uh, oh yeah, there's a lot we there's a lot we really don't know about that hasn't come out right. yet. And you may and when as the stuff develops, you may be surprised at what comes out on either. Um, Side sure. and, and and here's here's the thing um, before we wrap it up for tonight, Joe. It kind of just popped in my head. Now, obviously, you know it's interesting because uh, Megadeth, the two main guys, are both named Dave. And I, I I remember reading interviews and stuff back in the day, and they still even refer to David Elfson as as um, Dave Junior. And I think that may be that may have been something that um, Dave Mustaine started as in in the sense that okay, Megadeth is my band. I'm the front man. I'm I'm the main. I'm the main Dave. And I think it's just a way for people, fans, and people to refer to the two Daves as. And I think that says, you know, just a load, if you know what I mean, is I'm Dave and you're Dave Jr., if you know what I mean. <laughs> right. And, and I think, you know, you got egos working there. But that, that's what we were talking about earlier when I was saying how um, Ellison, you know, sued. That's what you're talking about when uh, um, Ellison sued uh, Dave um, Mustaine and... Mustaine has really never really forgotten about that, and he, he's told him over the years, and he, he's bringing it up now with, with this thing going on and saying, well, you know, he sued me before, and he really shouldn't have. He made a mistake, and he was ordered to pay me a lot of money, and I kind of settled with him out of court, and and I agreed to let him come back into the band, but, you know, he also agreed that he was, was not going to own a single part of a Megadeth name, and I guess, you know, you, you can cry about that and complain, but, you know, you made the deal, so say what you will, you know, and, and I don't think... Even when they had settled out of court, I don't think Mustaine was trying to tr uh, trick him or anything. He said, "Well, you know, this is a deal we're going to make. If you want back in the band, that's what you got to agree to." And he agreed to it. Yeah, you know, and going going back, uh, a good way to end this, I think, too, is uh, they must have done something right. Yeah, yeah. Because according to Nielsen Sound Scan, Megadeth has sold 9.2 million copies of its albums in just the United States alone between 1991 and 2014. And selling a total of 38 million units worldwide. Oh wow! That so they're, they're definitely one of the premier names up there with Metallica, Slayer, and Anthrax. Absolutely. That really is interesting. And and you know, here's where we're going to really end it. Is I will just end on this. Is it's kind of interesting. In spite of a lawsuit and everything, um, Megadeth, like you said, really never had a slow period except for that one Risk album. And it's interesting that. Um, I think um, more more fans returned to kind of buying Megadeth records once Ellison returned. So 
there's something to say about them being the two kind of core guys in the band. Once he came back, I think a lot of fans were r r digging that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Joe, um, you, you have a good rest of the um, evening, and I, I'll be talking to you next week, and we'll be doing another episode. Um, and we're going to be talking about Ronnie James Dio, and um, that's going to be a special episode because um, it was just the 11th uh, year anniversary of his death this this um, past May, so we're going to be getting into um, the early part of his career, and so that, that's going to be fun. So um, I'll be talking to you next week for that. All right, looking forward to it. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye.